Now I want to introduce one of our greatest conservation leaders here in the state of Texas, Ms. Laura Huffman, who is the state director of the Nature Conservancy. As state director, Laura heads a statewide team of scientists, conservation experts, and support staff whose work supports the Conservancy's 38 statewide preserves and touches every corner of Texas. She has authored a number of articles and op-ed pieces on a variety of conservation topics, including drought, water scarcity, and Gulf of Mexico protection. She has emerged as a national thought leader in the wake of the disastrous Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010. And Laura also works uh, worked closely with Texas legislators to draft legislation with far-reaching ramifications for water conservation and spearheaded the expansion of water protection funds for Austin, San Antonio, and surrounding counties. These citizen-approved funds have generated more than half a billion dollars to protect water in two of the fastest growing cities in the country. In 2012, Huffman was invited to attend the Clinton Global Initiative annual meeting and later met with officials from the U.S. Department of the Interior to discuss urban conservation. She is leading the Conservancy's North American Urban Conservation Strategy designed to ensure the protection of natural resources at the whole system scale. She's a native of Austin. And Laura has been in public service for more than 20 years. Prior to the Nature Conservancy, she served as the Deputy City Manager for the City of San Marcos and the Assistant City Manager for the City of Austin. So please welcome Laura Huffman. Thank you. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here. Uh, this is one of my favorite conferences of the, of the year, and I was thrilled to see such a good showing at the Capitol yesterday. There was lots of good buzz about how many of you went over to the state capitol to talk about the importance of our issues. Thought the comments by Senator uh, Hager were wonderful. It's almost as though everything that we have been working on for so many years is sinking in. It's kind of spooky in some ways. Um, I know many of you follow what's going on in the legislative session, and we do too, and some of the big bills that will affect our community involve funding of the state water plan at $2 billion, and it looks like there's going to be a conservation set aside of somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. So what I find so interesting about that is there's just a growing understanding uh, that people are seeing the relationship between the land conservation that we work on fresh water protection, and the health of the Gulf of Mexico. I find it fascinating that you can get a state senator up here, and without many notes, I don't think he had notes, he can make all, draw all those connections. Um, what Lori asked me to do is just kind of give you a, a peek at what it is that we're seeing coming down the pike from the Nature Conservancy. So I thought what I would do is play off some of the themes that you heard from Senator Hager, and that is the growth of our state. And when you look across the state of Texas, the single most significant trend that we will all be working with and around is growth. And you've heard the statistics before, our population is going to double sometime in the next 50 to 60 years. Interestingly, a statistic that sits right behind that isn't as discussed is most of that population is going to land in one of four major Texas cities. So our urbanizing trend is intensifying, not just here in Texas, it's actually happening all over the world, which is why the Nature Conservancy is, uh, a, has a new initiative of urban conservation. Now that doesn't mean we're going to be doing you know, conservation around the state capitol or in local parks, but what it does mean is that creates both um, some good news and some bad news for our community. The good news is that populations are going to be densifying in cities, which means that some of the sprawl that we've had to work around um, is, going to, is going to decrease. But the bad news is it means that people are going to become more and more distanced from the work that we do and the importance of the work that we do. And so I think in the coming years, one of our biggest challenges will be to communicate with these highly urban, 86% by the way of Texans already live in one of these big cities. Mm -hmm. Um, and what we worry about is whether or not people lose track of the fact that conservation is not just something that's nice to have in West Texas or Deep South Texas or East, you know, the force of East Texas, but the conservation work that you're working on and that we're working on is producing real tangible benefits for people that are living in downtown Houston. It's keeping the water clean. It's keeping those bays and estuaries clean. And something that we don't talk about often enough, I think, is it's protecting the cultural heritage of our state. 
Uh, conservation is about protecting natural resources so that you can feed people, so that they have access to fresh water, so that we can make sure people have the energy that they need in order to fuel their economies. And we draw those economic connections all the time. I think it's every bit as important to talk about the joy that protecting our, our beautiful places in Texas provide people and making sure that when we go from 25 million to 50 million people, that we haven't cut off the adventures that people can have on the rivers and lakes and streams in Texas. And we haven't cut off those opportunities to climb the mountains that we have in Texas or to hike in the forest that we have in East Texas. Those are really, really important parts of our state. In fact, the beauty of our state is the reason that we grow so well. Um, some of the states that don't grow so well aren't that pretty to be in. There's not that much left to protect. We are fortunate in that we live in a beautiful, diverse state where you can find almost every major ecosystem. And I think our challenge will be communicating not just the economic importance of protection, but also always underpinning that with the cultural heritage that these resources offer to today's citizens, but also tomorrow's citizens. So for this reason, the Nature Conservancy is developing a strategy for urban conservation. I find it interesting that our big federal agencies are also tracking this, and so are our state agencies. Um, so you've got the Department of Interior trying to figure out how can it relate its mission to a country that is urbanizing and growing very quickly, and you've got the state of Texas doing the same thing. So even though our work often expresses itself far outside of cities, I think we'll all be challenged to make sure that people understand its importance and its meaning. So with that, I will turn it over to Lori. Thanks again for coming to Austin. Great conference. It's a bigger room every year. It's so, I'm so enthusiastic about this, and I'm thrilled for those of you that are getting the accreditation. I feel your pain because we did it ourselves. Um, but it is worthwhile because, you know, again, tied to this theme of growth, it's important for people to be able to trust the work that we do. And I think getting those accreditations is a way of communicating to all of our, um, all of the Texans that we work with and for that the work has a sameness about it, whether or not you're working with an East Texas land trust or a West Texas land trust, that we are committed to a set of values and a methodology that stands up to scrutiny. So thank you. Thank you, Laura, that was great. And now I want to introduce uh, one of the finest ladies in the land trust movement in the nation, <laughs> uh, Miss Mary Pope Hudson. She's the executive vice president of the Land Trust Alliance. She joined the Alliance in 2002, and prior to this, she served as an executive director herself of the Low Country Open Land Trust, which is based in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, for five years. And prior to that, she worked um, as the director of education and tours for one of the first historic preservation organizations in America, which was the historic Charleston Foundation. She was the first woman appointed to the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources Board, and she helped start the coordinating body of land trusts, now known as the South Carolina Land Trust Network. Mary Pope earned her bachelor's degree um, in international affairs from Sweetbriar College, and prior to her work in land conservation, she served for 10 years in public service on Capitol Hill, working for Senator Jesse Helms as staff assistant with the Department of, Inter of the Interior, and as a political special assistant to Ambassador Hempstone in the U.S. Embassy, Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya. She also currently serves on the North American Wetlands Conservation Council on behalf of all land trusts. Please join me in welcoming Mary Pope Hudson. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be back in Texas. I tell you, every year, I think this is the ninth year that I've been to Texas as I look out and see so many friends and new friends that I hope to meet over the next two days. But um, it has just been amazing to me to see the enormous progress that has been made here in Texas. And I want to share with you that today I have Shannon Meyer with me who is the Southwest, Shannon will you stand, Southwest Conservation Manager for the Land Trust Alliance. <laughs> and Brian Martin who's here, I think Brian is External Relations Officer for the Alliance, may or may not be here but he'll be stepping back in. And I also wanted to say as an alliance I think right at the outset you all are well represented here in Texas, and I look over at Jennifer Lorenz, 
who served um, tirelessly on the Accreditation Commission, which no one gets an award for, but there will be wings for you in heaven, my dear. <laughs> also, Bob Ayers is a board member of the Land Trust Alliance. I wanted to say that, and has just been an incredible uh, support to us and started on the National Council, and I think you all know Bob, who's been really supportive of the activities here. And I look at Blair Fitzsimmons, who's now also um, going to get her wings serving on the Terra Firma um, board and steering committee that is launching, as we all know, in the, in the coming weeks. But I'm here today in particular to talk about the national picture. And I won't be as brief as as some of my um, predecessors because we have some serious things to talk about. Um, I thought today, since the Pope is stepping down, if I wore pink or red, it would not be good, but wearing orange for caution might be a good color in light of what's going on on Capitol Hill. I'm really excited to hear about the newly accredited land trusts in this state and just the amazing level of excellence that we have all seen together in this room because I think, you know, we're growing our ranks every year that I come back to this conference. And what has been amazing to me is that everybody has got their shoulder to the wheel on credibility, excellence, and building a strong and engaged community, not only with the Capitol Day yesterday, which I heard was a huge success, and I think Shannon and Brian participated with those of you who went up to the Hill. But I also want to thank those of you who are coming to Capitol Hill in Washington, um, which is just two weeks away, and I was going to look down here. I think we have somewhere close to 10 participants, um, which is really an amazing feat and probably the highest participating delegation coming to Washington to meet with senators and House members on the Hill March 12th and 13th to spread the message about the importance of land conservation. So I want to thank all of you who are coming and uh, we'll spread that great message because the, the message of engagement is really the message that I want to leave you all with today. Uh, as we all know, uh, state and federal funding will not materialize automatically. As we all need to show up and have a clear and concise message about conservation and its benefits, this puts an increased stress and strain on our community to coordinate that message. Here in Texas, with still 94% privately held, I believe this state and your landowners have the most exciting opportunity to really chart out your course for the landscape. It is with this underlying foundation that I'd like to elaborate on a few comments and significant factors that taken together give inspiration to us all. Before we sit down and evaluate these national challenges and opportunities, which are just huge. Just in the last five years, 27 land trusts in Texas have collectively become more politically engaged with a third, think about this, a third of the land trusts meeting their state and federal representatives. That is a huge step forward. You're doubling your endowments operationally. You're developing strategic conservation plans. And five of you that are now accredited join also 100 and, believe it or not, 96 others that are accredited, which, which comprise 50% of the protected land in America is now held by an accredited land trust. That is absolutely huge in five years, and it's a strong message to Congress. The five of you that are in the pipeline for accreditation and in this process, we're with you. We're glad you're doing it. Stay, stay with it. And I know there are many of you that are in this audience today who are thinking about accreditation. And uh, fear not. You can get through it if you decide to do it. 
This progress should be applauded, and your leadership has made it happen. All the while, we have been navigating, with all of those accomplishments, a recession. This is amazing. Your work is inspiring, and in a time of great uncertainty and change, this morning, um, we have to talk about some serious things. And I know you've had your coffee, but I regret to say I must come to you today with a dismal scenario at the national level that I hope will awaken your senses and ignite catalytic action. The cold reality is that growing fiscal problems for the United States and political polarization are translating into critical policy challenges for the land trust community over the next decade. Going into December's showdown on the fiscal cliff, mind you, that was 60 days ago only, land trusts faced one of the greatest threats to our work. The idea of capping the deductions at 25% per year a taxpayer could take in order to raise new revenue in one stroke that would have eliminated the tax incentives for conservation donations and bargain sales that have been a key element in almost one million acres of conservation a year. So in the last month of 2012, the Land Trust Alliance was able to activate, with your help, a broad bipartisan network of land trust staff and board members to make sure that House and Senate members and our friends in the Obama administration understood that a cap would bring conservation to a halt in America. Working in partnership with the independent sector and national and local charities, we were able to protect charitable deductions in the fiscal cliff negotiations. This was a huge victory. The nature of our network, with your engagement, allowed us to do more than just dodge a bullet. The fiscal cliff bill on January 1 reinstated enhanced federal tax incentives for donations of conservation easements that lapsed only a year ago. This is a two-year extension, which I think you're all aware of, that was retroactive back to the beginning of 2012 and will be in effect through this December. We believe with that legislation passing, this will be a banner year for conservation in 2013. So as you all know, the fiscal cliff deal did not resolve the nation's fiscal problems. And the Congress faces, and they are creating, <laughs> new cliffs tomorrow. Barring some last minute deal, sequestration will be applied, and all agencies of government will have across the board cuts. At the end of March, on the 27th, legislation that funds the government's operations will run out. And unless Congress acts, so this is our next fiscal cliff, unless Congress acts, we'll have a potential shutdown. If you're still enduring listening to this grim picture, bear with me. If that's not enough, there's a call for comprehensive tax reform by the end of 2013 which will likely revisit new limits on charitable gifts. We are also navigating the resuscitation of the Farm Bill that, as you all know, um, will be affected by this sequestration. And fortunately, last year in the House and Senate, we'd all built amazing support in one house to have $1.3 billion for conservation. And in the House of Representatives, that was the Senate, the first one, in the Senate, $1.5 billion for conservation. In the sequestration negotiations and the discussions about the operations at the end of March, we could lose $400 million in those discussions. So if that's not enough, in addition, the next few years will challenge all discretionary spending programs the North American Wetlands Council that we serve on for all of you, Forest Legacy, and Land and Water Conservation Fund. And lastly, we also face that one daunting challenge that no one likes to talk about, which is the IRS threats to conservation donors and the scrutiny required that the current audit system just needs to be replaced. I think we all know that. 
So in a nutshell, the tools and funding we've been using for decades are now at risk more than they ever have been before. So today I do not offer one solution to this conundrum, but I ask for your help as we face all of this together. Now is our moment in time to be proactive with policymakers. We heard it today from one of them right here. If we do not do this, this will be at our own peril. Today I'm happy to announce that the Alliance Board, of which Bob Ayers, as you know, is a member, um, the board has committed to grow our policy program to build political influence for the land. They have committed to double our budget for policy work. And that would do several things. One, add another senior policy director to lead a national network, a grass tops network of key relationships that can impact and influence members of Congress. Two, recruit, provide recruitment and training for staff and board members across this country in every state. Three, build strong champions for private lands conservation in both parties. And lastly, provide education and direct to land trusts public funding, money for public funding and incentives for conservation at the state and local level, working in partnership with the Nature Conservancy and the Trust for Public Land. And lastly, invest in our engagement with the IRS and the tax writing committees to deal with comprehensive tax reform. So we're doubling our investment. And so this is where you come in. We need your help. Number one, in engaging with your policy decision makers at every level of government. And as you heard from the senator this morning, not just when they're in session, when they're in their home districts telling the story about the great work of conservation, ramping up these success stories and speaking with a coordinated voice with the Texas Land Trust Council and with each other, remembering that the work we do together is going to benefit the whole, always working in coordination, and working together with the Land Trust Alliance to make the great case for conservation. We all know that pace, quality, and permanence are important for us to espouse and to build the credibility of the land trust movement. But without relevance, we are never going to be able to do our work. So I thank you for everything you're doing. Appreciate all that you do every single day to build a lasting natural legacy for conservation right here in Texas. Take care. Bye-bye.